All right, guys, so we have a special treat for you today. We have Andres Moline here. He's an incredible macro photographer. You probably won't say that yourself, but I can say that about you. <laughs> He's really world-class. Your images are unbelievable. Thank you, Patrick. Actually, thank you for having me here today. Hey, um, anytime somebody says they're in Puerto Rico, I'm like, hey, <laughs> come down and we would love to feature you. So you've actually been in Charleston working with David on a full-blown F-stoppers tutorial. That is correct. It wasn't just wasn't just Charleston though. Where all did you guys go? We you... actually also went to uh, Costa Rica. We went to uh, a beautiful part of Costa Rica, which is La, La Selva, the, the tropical forest of Costa Rica, mm. to find some interesting subjects to photograph. I'm super jealous because I was at the house while you guys were filming, and you had all these insects and everything. And if you've seen or critique the community before, you know that Lee and I don't know a whole lot about this field. And many times we're critiquing images and we're like, eh, it looks weird. And then I talk to you and you're like, that's unbelievable. How did they find that insect? The technique that they used to pull that off was extremely difficult. So we're excited to have you here. Thank you very much. And this isn't a normal critique the community. We're just gonna be talking about 16 awesome images that we pulled from the community. And we're not really gonna get focused in on the ratings and, and anything like that. But now that we have you here, you can give us your expertise and share and enlighten our audience on how amazing some of these photos are and how they were be, shot. I will be glad to be able to shine some light onto this macrophotography that you guys don't quite understand yet. If you're interested in learning more about the tutorial that's coming up soon, you can go to the link below. We have a mailing list. You can subscribe to that. And then as soon as this tutorial is released, there'll be maybe an early bird special or some kind of preview that you can have before the tutorial is available. So definitely check that out. Let's get started here. We'll start with this first image. And to my untrained eye, this is just a normal fly, but maybe to you, this is some exotic fly from somewhere else around the world. What, what are we looking at here? Do you know? Well, actually, uh, what we have here, it is a, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's not a very common fly, to be honest with you, because I haven't seen one that has this many spikes before. Um, but it is a beautiful photograph indeed. Uh, as you can see, there is a lot of detail that, that yes. has been brought out in this photograph. And having this uh, white background also enhances the photograph. It's, it's definitely a stack. It's, I, I mean, I, I know that not many people know what a stack is, right? Yeah, but so explain to everyone what is a stack so, image. So this, the way these photographs are done so that you have very, depth, like very much depth of field, like you can see in this photograph, it's that uh, multiple pictures are taken, and then all of them are blended together. And by blending these photographs, you get the most depth of field possible. Yeah. And so when you can see here. So typically with a macro lens, you're gonna be able to get really close and get a lot of detail, but it's gonna be razor thin. Correct. It's so gonna go blurry really quickly. It's very shallow, yeah. So yes. you have a focal plane, and the more focal planes that you uh, accommodate together, the better depth of field you get. So that's what an actual stack is. And that's what you see in this photograph. Do you think, and then this is probably a question that's gonna get brought up a lot with these images, do you think this insect or this fly is alive or is it easy to get a stack <laughs> of an insect when they're moving around and I assume it takes some time to get the, the, the focus stack? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's alive indeed. Uh, there's several techniques uh, in order to be able to get uh, or to approach an insect like, like this type of insect and get close to them. And one of them is by you know, feeding them prior to photographing them. So you can sort of like place a trap, uh, like a, a drop of sugar somewhere nearby. And then, you know, that will have a fly like this, you know, mm. attracted and they might come to feed on that sugar. So there may be like a, a food right in front of them and then you could Photoshop the food out. That's and correct. And he's gonna stay there that's, longer. That's, the, yeah, that's, that's one way to do it. The other thing is that insects do sleep as well, like any other animal. So depending on the time of the day that you photograph them, they may not move as much. Hmm. Do they, are they like humans when they eat, then they get tired, and then they just sit? Same thing. So you feed them, and you then they go into a food coma. That, that's correct. They can go food comatose. You know, a lot of times people think that y y we place the insects in the fridge and that we cool them down. and That's not necessarily true. It's just that there's different ways of approaching the, the, the insects. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, maybe this, is, this was shot very early in the morning when they're still asleep and the, the body's still cold. Hmm. Uh, you know, as, as the day goes by and they get warmer, they yeah. become more active. Yeah. Yeah. But it's Great. a beautiful picture uh, indeed. We'll also have all of these images featured in the post on F-Stoppers. So if you <coughs> want to see who these photographers are and look at some of their entire portfolio, definitely check out the link in the description that will send you to the post with all of these photographers. Now, this looks very familiar. 
Yeah, this is this photograph. Actually, I think I know the person that photograph that, that shot this this photograph, and uh, it was is Lisa. Yeah. She was actually with us uh, in your house in Charleston. Yeah. So we were shooting the the <laughs> intro to the tutorial. What I learned is <coughs> Lisa is an insect handler, grower. She raises them. I, I don't know what the proper word is for this, but she showed up to our house to help out with the tutorial. So yes. not only we had two amazing. <laughs> macro photographers at my place at one time and she brought all these incredible insects for you guys to shoot yeah and this well, is one of her images this is now, one of her had, images yeah yeah she had this i i don't know if it was this specific species but she had one of these baby what is this this is a, this is a nymph of a uh, flower mantis that is called um let me see i think we may be able an, or an orchid mantis so this is a newborn. This is a this is very small actually. So yeah. this th this photograph is probably like uh, three times magnification in order to be able to get that insect. You know, as you see it there. You can see in the back there's another one. Yeah. Uh, obviously there's not enough. Uh, there's not enough. Uh, the depth of field. Depth so of field is so shallow that yeah, correct. That's kind of cool. I like what she did with this because it, it puts some context in there. It, it makes it feel more like a community. It makes it feel more like real life. I assume. This is kind of a controlled environment. She probably has a leaf that she's then placed the insects on. Yeah, I would, Im I would definitely imagine that this is in a controlled environment. And, uh, you know, I am not sure if this is a stack because uh, sometimes she does the stacks, m many times she does the stacks, but she's pretty good too at, at, at playing with the focal plane and getting a single shot that, that looks quite yeah. uh, crisp. And this might be one of those cases. Now, when you talk about stacks, I would imagine <coughs> you would stack a bunch of pictures together and have a nice sharp image. But would you ever stack only a few images and still maintain the shallow depth of the field? Meaning, would you stack, say, like four or five images to get the front of the, the mantis in focus, but then still use the shallow depth of the field? Or yeah, do you do typically stack the entire insect? Well, it, it depends, but I mean, what you're, what you're saying is true. Sometimes what you want to do is not to stack the whole image because when you're doing macro, there's there are certain factors where having everything sharp is really important, right? Right. But having things sharp doesn't necessarily mean that the photo c creates a good photo. Right. So you have to be able to create a mood. You have to be able to create this space and environment, like she did right here with the playing with the depth of field, and this also creates separation from the subject and the background, and this allows for a very nice sharp uh, outline of the insect. Even if the insect is not all in focus, it, yeah. makes, it makes it look like, the, like, like it is in focus. Especially I could see with the antennas. Maybe the antennas you want in focus, but they're, you know, especially the one on the right might be going back. Correct. You could focus stack and then blur, you know, just, you know, mask back in the antennas, but then you want the body and you want the second mantis completely out of focus. In, really in, cool. In, this indeed, this indeed. image is, I see this on f-stoppers all the time. People seem to love that one. Next shot, <coughs> I liked this image because it reminded me of, you know, the images that you'd see in science class where they have every insect that you might see in this particular part of the world and just seemed like the best way to document That's correct. an insect. And, and what are we looking at here? This almost looks like an ant, an ant this, or a... This is definitely an ant, yeah. I mean, <coughs> I, mean I don't know what, which type of ant is um, because not all ants have wings, right? And this one definitely has some wings. Uh, okay, here is a uh, so nice species. What's nice about this critique is we, we actually have some of the information here. So this was shot at 5.6, eighth of a second ISO 100. I don't know if that means anything to you. It doesn't mean a whole lot to me, but it was <laughs> stacked. So I assume you don't have to shoot at the largest depth of field when you're stacking. This is actually quite interesting because uh, at the settings, one eighth of a second, uh, so it, it means that he's probably not using uh, a flash and he's maybe, he says homemade diffuser, but one eighth of a second. I don't know what the sync speed of the Sony A7 or th A7 III. Yeah, it's definitely above it's an interesting. eighth of a second. But it says, it's a stacking and a panorama of 45 shots. So Could it means they have used a diffuser to diffuse natural light? Yeah, you can, 100%. And maybe that's why it's a so slow shutter? I think that's the reason why I think. I think he's probably diffused a like LED light or something else of that kind in that, in that strobe. But uh, <clears throat> these photos are actually, a lot of people don't like photos of dead insects, right? But if you understand that by taking these type of photos that have so much detail to them, 
you can share this with m various uh, schools. Yeah. That means that not every school needs to have one dead specimen in it, mm. right? So, I mean, I'm also, when it comes to science and things like that, I always feel that, that this is a positive uh, type of photography, even though a lot of people criticize it. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because uh, we get criticized all the time. People think that everything that we're shooting are, is dead or either yeah. we froze them or spray some hairspray in them so they don't move around. <laughs> Crazy well, it's amazing because I, I don't know. I'm sure this type of photography has been done for you know decades, but as a kid in science class, you know, especially or in college taking biology classes, I would see diagrams and like illustrations a lot of times, but they never had. I, I assume the photography coming out of the macro world now is better than it's ever been. Yeah, correct. Just with the technology, the technology and has with allowed the allowed megapixels and all the cameras and lenses. So it's always interesting to see this because it really gives you an idea of what nature, the beauty within nature really looks like. That's correct. Something an illustration could never really I, do. I totally agree with you in that. Oh, look at this, a photo of the day. And this is photographed by Brian Rogers, who oh, yes, Mr. is an incredible Rogers. product photographer. I picked out this image not even knowing that this was his work. I just wanted to include some other things besides insects. Yeah, correct. But we actually made a <laughs> tutorial with Brian, so he's, always doing stuff like this and this is a masterpiece in, in reality people don't when, when people look photos of uh, like especially like watches or jewelry and things like that they, they, they don't really fully understand the amount of work that it takes to get the light right yep. uh, in order for you to get all this depth of feel you'll definitely do a stacking but but the light needs to be right in order for the for the product to pop and uh, you can see here that he's he's done a wonderful job at, at uh, bringing all the numbers together, you can see this, the, the, how the highlights are playing in this photograph, and the, the, f the control of the light is amazing because w when you're stacking, since you're taking so many photos, the light does change, and even though we are usually controlling the camera by setting everything in manual and the exposures and the temperature and all these other things, as you're taking the photos, things still do change. You know, vibrations on, 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 on the room, right. small vibrations on the floor, you know, anything can, can alter the photo. And uh, this One big one with a focus stack like this, I think Brian <coughs> says this is 35 frames. That's correct. 35 I frames to get this. And having worked with Brian, I know that, and you've probably experienced this yourself if you're a photographer out there, when you change the focus, especially on a macro lens, the, the blur and the bokeh, it, it expands and gets big. So if you have detailed lighting, especially on the hands of the watch and everything, oh, yeah. there's areas that you're gonna have to mask out because your light now is gonna become thicker and wider. That's correct. And so not only are you trying to get the depth of field to be sharp throughout 35 frames, but you're also having to selectively choose you know, which frames to use because your bokeh is gonna ruin parts of the frame even though they're adding detail to other parts. So. Luckily, there's a lot of software that can help automate that. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, the, the, the software helps to a certain point, though. As you mentioned before, you, you may have the entire so the software do the entire stack, but then you have to bring back some frames and yep. photo blend them to make sure that the there's detail is... inconsistency that's correct. and there's little issues. But that's correct. Really Be cool shot, picture, yeah. and uh, it's funny. I hope no... I'm not encouraging anyone to do this, but one of the very first videos F-Stoppers ever produced was Lee taking a watch and we did everything wrong. And it, you know, it's in 720 and you know, it was 10 years ago, but having now worked with a lot of photographers who do this kind of stuff, you know, it's amazing what you can do if you know the right techniques. And it's amazing how bad of a shot, not that our shot was horrible, but it was nowhere near this quality, you know. No, we you know, the funniest thing is that most of the best shots, they seem to be simple. Yeah. Right, but then when you start looking into it, it they, they're, quite hard to, <laughs> to to get. Yeah, this next shot, I didn't really know what I was looking at. I still don't know if I completely know, but it was so different and cool. I think I wanted, you know, I just thought I needed to include it. And this is a Brush. ongoing series involving paint, inks, and small objects shot in macro. So this is a true mixed medium sort of art form. Wow, this is actually wonderful. It just looks like another universe <laughs> yeah it's it's so amazing to see how much depth there is because i own one or two macro lenses and the only times i ever really used them was to shoot the rings at weddings but i know placing rings on organic objects many times i would shoot a macro shot 
in something you would think would look really cool, like a piece of wood, macro, suddenly you see all of the... Imperfections in... Yeah, or <laughs> it just doesn't look as cool. Like, it looks cooler <clears throat> from far away, but when you zoom in, it's at, maybe it's actually very... Uh, the pattern's very similar, and it doesn't have as much texture as you want. Um, like marble and stuff, you would zoom mm -hmm. in on marble, and it looks cool from far away, but then when you get right on top of it, it's, it's so polished, it, it doesn't look as cool as you think it would. Yeah, Seeing sure. an image like this... It looks like it has so much texture that I would imagine as an artist, how do you create so much variation at a macro level? I guess what I'm trying to say is many paintings shot with a macro lens yeah, might look more simple where this looks extremely detailed and chaotic and that's what makes this so beautiful. I mean, this is definitely, st I, I don't understand how it was, uh, like, I mean, not the photograph, but the mix of paint and things. I don't know how they achieved all these lines and yeah. bubble-like things. And I mean, I don't know if this is a stack. It, it seems like this was just shot at, you know, like maybe F22 or, or F... Yeah, when you're looking at something like this, it's, it's so hard to even know what the depth is. I mean, this could be very flat. Yeah, correct. But it also could, you know, have globs of paint that are have a lot of elevation and need... It's need a stacking definitely effect. very, very unique photograph. Now, Jeffrey's images have shown up in our critiques quite a bit. There actually may be another image of his in this discussion, but this one caught my eye just because of the texture and the, the gradient of the lighting. And then, of course, the lizard skin is just perfect for macro. It has all that detail in it. I mean, I, I, I like lizards when, when it comes to photographs because they have, you said, a de so, mu so much texture and detail in their skin that no matter where you're, where you're looking at the photo, there is always something interesting to, to, to see and you'll find new things. Like it has like little white dots on the side and, you know, I mean, like sometimes when you're looking at the animal as a whole, you don't realize those beautiful small details that m make the skin of this, this, this animal such an interesting uh, photograph. I, I think the, the, the crop on this photo <clears throat> it doesn't quite work for me because one of the legs mm. is kind of like, like the ones in the back don't bother me so much because they're already like shaded, but the one in the top is like, where is he holding from? Or like, yeah. is he holding to something or, you know? How do you think this was shot? Was this shot, because the lizards that I've always run into are always trying to run from me. And then <laughs> he's got this nice black backdrop, you know? I don't know if he's on plexi or if there's a way to shoot a lizard in nature and you overpower the ambient light so much with your flash that the background goes black. Yeah, so, so yeah, you can do that. But in this case, um, it, it seems that it's definitely standing on something. I mean, the, the problem is that because we don't see what's happening with the other leg, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to fully tell. But um, it, do you think he's on some kind of black background though? It could be, yeah. I mean, he's definitely using one directional light uh, on, on this shot. Yeah. I, I, Saw this one, it really stood out, and uh, very cool use of, of a macro lens. So this is a motherboard, but this is like, it seems to be lit from behind as well. Like, you, you know that these boards are like translucent, right? They, they, even though they're green or yep. brown or red or whatever, but they still have translucency to it because they're made out of like uh, glass. They have yep. some glass elements to them. But uh, <clears throat> in here, you can see how it glows through the light from behind or something. Yeah, we just recently did a <coughs> critique um, on our channel that you guys can check out where we talk about images that have made a lot of money. And mm -hmm. I think the cutoff was about $2,000. So if you've ever made an image that you licensed or sold or were commissioned for for at least $2,000 or more, um, we did a whole kind of discussion about images that have made money. This seems like one of those images where I could see this having a lot of commercial use. Sometimes oh, with yeah. the insects and stuff, I don't quite know, besides maybe National Geographic or some conservatory or something. I don't always know what all the uses are. Maybe you can talk about that later. But an image like this, it's, it can represent so many things, you know, technology and computer science and... I totally agree, and especially when you're trying to shoot... Uh, I mean, th this is not an uncommon thing, right? It's very common, but nobody has photographed it. Yeah. Which is proof of what you're saying right now. Um, I, will, I will imagine that this will definitely make good money. Uh, I mean, I, I can see so many uses for a photo like this that uh, it 
I mean, this is definitely something that I will be trying to do. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like it, it falls kind of in that fine art <clears throat> world where I could see, you know, if you had a cool nightclub or the bar at the, at the oh, hotel, yeah. you could print something like this and then light it with a hard light. Yeah. And when you walk into the bar, it's got a futuristic look. Like there's just so many uses for this that aren't just in the computer science field. And I think it's really cool. There was actually a lot of images. Anita might actually have more images like this in her own portfolio. But I saw a lot of shots of motherboards lit in a really interesting way. You know, what I like about this as well, uh, Patrick, is that when you're looking at this photo, you start swimming in and you get closer, not everything is in detail, right? Yeah. I mean, this is definitely a, a single shot. Uh, because you can see that a lot of these parts are not in detail. You can see where the focal plane actually hit the, 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 the lower right of the, of the photograph, and that's where the plane actually... Yeah. Now, the version that I have is also fairly low res, but... But it, it's still, I mean, I, I you think can it, still tell. It, it works. It looks beautiful. The fact that it has that blurriness uh, in the corners and it has the, the softness to it, it brings your eye to the middle of the photo. Yeah. I mean, it, it's... Well, that's another important very thing to say is, like, having total depth of field isn't always... Isn't always important. Isn't no. always important. Oh, no, that's correct. Speaking of conceptual art and fine art, this was another image, which I think we already featured, Jamie. I think he had... Uh, the painting image that we just looked at. Oh yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, this shot really stood out to me. And I think the reason I like this is if this is truly macro, the lines in this are so sharp that this feels almost man-made. And it feels like you're looking from like an aerial view down on something. But then when you start to think that this might be a macro shot. Of something very small. There's there. something that's just, it leads your mind to wonder what are we looking at. And on some levels, this looks like you're shooting from far away. But then because it's a macro shot, you're thinking, well, how close are we? What is this material? How did we create such a nice shape in that material? And I definitely think that the way this photograph was pro uh, processed, uh, I mean, it has a, like, yeah, again, you don't know if it's like a shine of metallic or this is a piece of carved wood. And I mean, I, I mean, it's hard to tell what it is, but it, it definitely works. And it, it's very, Yeah, and it's very, you don't know if there's image. even color, you know? Like, this could be rusty or something, but because it's a black and white conversion, I assume, it has a totally different feel, but maybe this is the natural color, too. Maybe it's not in black and white. It's good to see photos like this that Jamie has taken here because, like you said it earlier, I know people love the fact that the the insects are something that is hard to observe. They're hard to see in, 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 up close and yeah. in detail. But a lot of the money that is made with macro photography is usually by using the techniques of, of, of macro to take photographs of things that you don't expect. You actually take pictures of bullets that are found on crime scenes. Correct. And through all the indentions and, and the way the bullet's been shaped after it's come out of the chamber, like, you can help identify. You can help identify. Oh, yeah. And you can tell which gun it came out of and narrow down the and guns. And how, if it, if it ricochet, how it went, how it created the entry and yeah. the exit of the wound. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. And, uh, again, I mean, it's a type of photography that, that uh, for macro, it pays uh, pretty well as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice stack. The light is wonderful. So, I mean, this is some sort of bee. Yeah, I don't know if it's a bumblebee or let's see if it says here. Silocopa? Uh, Silocopa species, yeah. So, you know, this is fairly large size bee, uh, but uh, this is a beautiful stack. When photographing some insects, and this is one of those cases, I mean, this beautiful symmetry, as you can see here, but by looking at the eyes, you can tell that this is not a, a duplicate. Sometimes you can take a picture mm. and then, you know, if you're looking for symmetry, just cut it in half and duplicate the, 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 the photo because insects are very symmetrical, right. right? But here you can see in the eyes how the light is bouncing in different ways. And you can also look down at the bottom. I don't know what his mouth area would be called, but you can tell there that it's not perfectly symmetrical. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. You can if see you do that this on well. the human face, it looks incredibly weird. Yeah, that's correct. You always <laughs> can tell if somebody's... So this image is a stack of 55 shots, also at a slow shutter. So I don't know if this, this might be the same photographer as the one that did the ant. Pure. And so maybe this is also using Sony a diffuser, but using natural light or an LED, a hot light, something that needs a longer exposure than flash, would be yeah, my guess. Yeah, he's, he's using a stack rail, as I can see here, magnification 251. Yeah, so 
So this is a, it's a dead insect. Uh, but it, I mean, again, people have to understand that you do find many times you can find dead bees. You know, especially when you're looking for insects, and that's what people don't understand. They think that you're going out to hunt them and to freeze them and put them in the fridge and kill them to take a picture like this where the insect will stand still. But the reality is that sometimes when we are out in the field looking for insects, many times we find dead insects. Yeah. Because, you know, they do die as well, right? And if you're lucky, you can find one of these large bees or larger bees and then bring them home and you know, with the right technique, you can clean them up and then you can set them up and stack them like he's done here. But I mean, the now results are beautiful. you mentioned you think this was shot maybe because of the number of shots, 55 shots. You think this was shot with a rail. Do you want to describe what a rail is? Because I had no idea what this was until I saw you using it. Yeah, so, okay, so there's different type of rails. Uh, but the rail is simply, it's a piece of equipment where you can load up your camera and then with a micrometer, you can control how many times the camera moves towards the subject. When you're doing um, a, a stacks where you, you're taking actual slices and it just slices one of those focal planes, right? Uh, so what you do with the rail is that you start bringing the entire camera, not just the, not just the focal ring of mm -hmm. the lens, but the entire camera closer and closer and closer to the subject. So you continuously take more and more slices and then you put them all together. So it sounds like using a rail is actually more, uh, you create more of a pristine shot and you get the it's images more in a cleaner. Accurate much more accurate and precise. That's correct. Very interesting. So this shot, I don't know if it's the low resolution from them uploading it, but you know, it's, it's hard to tell what's in focus and how high res the image is, but I, I just thought this was interesting, one, because of the, the bumblebee, but then it's enclosed in something. And I don't know if that's a flower, it looks like soap. If it's like <laughs> crystals or, I don't know what we're looking at. Maybe, maybe you've seen this before, but I just thought the framing of this was kind of interesting. So. Again, I mean, this is a beautiful photograph. It, this is not a stack, this is a single shot. And what the photographer is, his name is uh, uh, Graham uh, Mayers. What he's done is that he made sure to put that focal plane on the eyes, right? So when you're looking up close, you can see that the eyes are actually in focus. Yep. Uh, when you're photographing insects, the same as photographing people, as long as the eyes are sharp, you know, people will forgive many other things, right? Right. And what he's done here is that he made sure to put emphasis on the composition. As you can see, this bee is inside of an actual flower. And what you see here around it is the canal of whichever hmm. flower it is that, that this bee is uh, sitting on right now. So do you think this flower was cut and he's shooting back out or the bee is coming out and he's shooting down? Actually, the bee is coming out and he's shooting down. Okay. Because that's such a strange orientation. Like, I don't yeah. obviously shoot many flowers in this way, so I don't exactly know what I'm looking at. But, but it's interesting because, I mean, th obviously you c there is a lot of parts of the highlights are blown out a little bit, right? Yep. But th just, just the inner color of the flower and how the bee is, is positioned in the center, it just makes for a very beautiful um, photograph, you know? I mean, not necessarily, it's the same thing when you're taking pictures of insects, you have to consider that this flower might be moving around, right? And you need to have the flash to like stop the movement of everything that is happening around it. And it's not easy. Yep. You know, it, it's quite difficult. So you're trying to get a beautiful composition like he did right here. And at the same time, get the flower not to move, the bee not to fly away, you know what I mean? Like there's many factors that oh, are yes. happening while you know, these photographs are taken. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful uh, shot. And on this shot, we can actually see this was shot on a Nikon D800. And unlike some of the other settings that we've looked at, this is a 105 macro, but they shot at f18, f18. and one two fiftieth of a second. Which so that's pretty easy then to know that the flash, yeah. at two fiftieth of a second, that's such a fast shutter, this was using strobes, whereas some of the slower shutters that we've seen, they were probably continuous using light or, yeah, natural correct. light or continuous light. And then as you said, you probably wouldn't shoot at f18 if you're doing a stack. I will, yeah, I will not. Uh, that's not, especially for, I mean, I'm, I'm using Canon uh, uh, lenses and the, the sweet spot is somewhere between f8 and, and f11. So I usually try to stand uh, within those uh, parameters. But and, sometimes and I if do you a need, lot of stacking. <laughs> if you need that one shot, like as wedding photographers, I couldn't sit around and stack images. I will definitely close. Yeah, you yeah, would yeah. sometimes sacrifice the optimal aperture in order to get the, the cleanest shot. What you see here, it's, it's, it's a beautiful horsefly or deer fly. 
is one of those two species. I love how you love, you think that horse flies are beautiful. Because they are the <laughs> enemy. They are, they are the when enemy. When I have a horse fly, he's anything but beautiful to me. They, but. Bite, they bite quite hard too, I tell you that. Um, but they have beautiful eyes. And, you know, it's very unfortunate. You know, th this, this photograph is interesting because it has an interesting light. Uh, most of the times, these are shot very bright, like you see in, in, yep. my, fo in my photographs where you're just trying to bring all the detail and colors out of the eyes. But you know, here he chose to do it in a different way, which I, I, I think works really well with, the, with those blues and hues of greens, but it's definitely, it, you cannot see what's happening with the reds. Uh, this is a female because I can see the mouth. Let me see, yeah, this is a female. You can see the mouth and, all, and, and actually, there's a gap between the eyes. So that's also a way to tell that it's a female, but, uh, this is uh, hard to tell whether it's been stacked or, mm, let me see. I think, I think this might be a stack. I don't know how many shots, but, but again, it's, it's, it's a very interesting photograph. And uh, yeah, they do bite hard though. I've been beaten many times for the photo. <laughs> What's interesting, just listening to you talk through this critique, but also you know, watching you work in the studio, is that, and I've seen this with, I mean, most, successful photographers are this way as well. But you really become passionate about the whole field that you're shooting. So you know the species, you know the animals, the insects, you can tell if it's female <laughs> or male. Where, you know, I think if you want to be a fashion photographer, a lot of people just think, oh, I learned the fashion lighting. But every good fashion photographer I know, they know the trends and they know the clothing. Or if you're an uh, architectural photographer, you know all the building techniques and I just find that always really interesting that, you know, when you get <laughs> submerged in a certain field, you take it beyond just the photography. Like you start to know like this particular insect is found in this part of the world. And some of the stuff that we were shooting was not even in North America. That's correct. They were. Yeah, they're not <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's funny, Patrick, but uh, you know, when you start doing this type of micro photography, um, you start learning about the subject because that's the only way that you can really understand how to photograph them. Yeah. And, and then, you know, once you understand how they behave and the, where the environment they're, they're found and all these other things, then you'll be impressed how easy it is for you to approach them and, and get those shots. And then that's when uh, people say like, oh, do you kill these insects or are they alive? You know, yeah. the, you know they're alive and because, yeah, you, you grow this passion for understanding. And, and, and not so much of the insect itself, but nature, right? And yeah and how important they are for the environment and you know, like how the things that we're doing that are affecting them and yeah, it's, yeah, there's a lot of passion behind it. That's, that is for, for sure. Now this next photo was extremely interesting and I thought, oh, this is a, a different technique that we should show. But then av after reading the description, I realized this image has been created entirely in camera. They say with zero Photoshop. Now, part of me thinks that there was some kind of tweaking to get the colors and the contrast, but they're claiming none of this was created by stacking or doing photo manipulation. Have you seen an image like this before? You know, I haven't actually seen anything done like this, especially because they're incorporating the eye and that has to be shot at 100 millimeters at least, right? So I understand how this has been done in camera, but the post, the post pro uh, processing aspect of it, you know, when he's blending the eye with everything else, yeah. I mean, that is photo manipulation because 100 millimeter will not take the same like wide angle that you need for the trees because it says here that these are like pine trees, right? You can see, you can see the veins from the eye and you can see some yeah, of the eye. Yeah, so eyelashes. I'm trying to understand too because it sounds like this is a multiple exposure made in camera. And what you're saying is that the eye would have been shot with a macro lens, which is what they say here in the description. But then to get the ghosting effect of the forest, they have spun the camera around a bunch of different ways. But perhaps could they have taken the macro lens off? Is that what you're suggesting? And they've now put a wider lens to get the the forest well, or could this be a macro shot of something smaller than trees i was gonna say that maybe this is something smaller than trees like moss or something it's, just, it's really hard to tell 
as much information as they've given us here, I still would There's love not to enough know information here. even more about this because it's it's definitely a multiple exposure. It's done in camera with a macro lens, but maybe it uses a different lens. Or okay, so may maybe the 100 the 100 millimeter macro lens or 105s. It doesn't say which lens they, they use here. So the 90, the 105, the 100, they can shoot a macro and then they can shoot to infinity. So mm. maybe maybe so this is like a shot. telephoto maybe, shot. Yeah, it's correct. Maybe this is more like a telephoto where they use the macro mode, they shot the eye, and then they zoomed out to infinity, and then they focus on that would make the trees a and little bit more sense. Then rotated them around. I mean, I don't know. Whichever way this is done is wonderful, and yeah. I would love to know more about this. It looks beautiful. Now, this is actually an image that we were scrolling through, and you saw this image and said, oh, you need to throw that in there, because this is the only, as far as I know, the only wide-angle yeah. macro shot. That's correct. This is very interesting. So, I mean, right now they're making wide-angle lenses for macro, right? But it's quite quite new, Lao, Laowa or Lao. I don't know how you actually pronounce it. Is this that it. long lens, or? Well, that's one of them, but no, they actually have one that is uh, um, 11 or, uh, or, or 13 or 14 millimeters. I don't know, but it's, it's a wide angle uh, macro lens by Laowa. Laowa is one of those companies, a uh, Chinese company, which actually makes quite a uh, good glass. They have this, and they're able to do this wide angle. However, I was looking at, I was watching actually a video, I, I can't remember who it was from, but they were using uh, telephoto lenses to do this same type of photos. And how would you do that with a telephoto lens? It's, it's, it's kind of weird because the thing is that uh, some of the new, uh, I mean, I don't know if the Nikon does the same, but Canon lenses are doing, uh, the 100 to 400, you can zoom at 36 uh, inches. Okay. So, but when you're at 36, you'll be able to focus, right? So if you're 36, you focus, you zoom, you zoom in to 200, 300 or 400, mm -hmm. you're actually getting sort of what, a macro effect. So the zoom lens allows you to zoom in really close, but unlike normal zoom lenses, the minimum focusing distance is small it's enough it's, yeah, correct. that you start to get into that one-to-one -one ratio. You get really close to the macro settings. That's correct. Settings. So it gives you that feeling. So because, I mean, taking photos like this is, is, is not easy. I mean, it, it, they, they seem quite simple. Your phone maybe can do it. Yeah. But when you're using a camera, it's, it's just it's more, much more complicated. Uh, and this one looks quite, quite nice. I mean, I, uh, this is a good example of it. I'm not saying this is the best way that this can be done, but this is definitely a great example. I mean, you can see how many mushrooms are all the way to, to, you know, to, towards the back, and yeah. you know, some, some of them are in full focus, some of them are not. It's kind of strange that uh, this, the second one behind, it's got part of it in focus, but then the one in front is not. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so again, this might be like a mix of photos some kind of stack where that Some kind work. of stack where not everything is stacked. I mean, the, the leaf behind the stem of the front, of the mushroom in the front is in focus, but the front of the stem is not. Ah, oh, so and you're starting to find, yeah, I see. And so, I mean, this is a very strange focal plane. Lee I mean, always says something fishy is going on. There is something on. fishy about this. But you know what, but I, I, I like it. I mean, I think this might, this might have been done in, in a single shot. Yeah, and it does show a technique that Otherwise, we haven't seen throughout these images yet. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Liza, she's good, man. She's really good. Uh, you know, this is a, a photo stack. A what, is, what is Liza's last name? Rock. Is it Rock? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was like a stage name. No. Her, Liza Rock. Her, husband, her husband's uh, name is uh, Mr. Rock. He's actually a musician. <laughs> well, that's the perfect <laughs> last name. <laughs> Rob Rock. <laughs> uh, this is a beautiful photograph. Um, this is a Philippus uh, jumper, Adumbratus, which is, the Philippus are from, the, from North and Central America, and they're quite large spiders. So a lot of times when you know, we're photographing spiders, we choose to, to photograph these type of spiders because of the size, right? I mean, they're much bigger. And you know, sometimes they don't, they don't move as much mm -hmm. as the smaller uh, jumper spiders. But uh, this is probably, I will say, 15 frames or more stacked. She said, it says here, 40 45, frames. wow, yeah, this is, uh, so this is one of the, oh, it's a handheld one. So this is the technique that we talked about before. Yeah, so you have to describe this because this really blew my mind. We've talked about putting the camera on a rail system and shooting kind of in the studio setting where you're moving the camera very meticulously. Correct. But you can do a similar technique handheld. That's, that's How correct. How in the world do you pull that off? 
Okay, so what the first thing that you have to do is you have to be using a flash, right? So we need you need strobes, uh, and then we need to have a, 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 a external pack, a battery pack, because the okay. problem is that when you start shooting multiple rounds, your flash cannot keep up. Right. right, the batteries in your flash will not be able to keep up with you shooting uh, so constant. So we usually take a battery pack called Godox. That's actually just a brain, uh, and then uh, we plug that into the flash, and we set up the flash maybe uh, one eighth or one sixteenth of the power. So it's quite low. Yeah. And then that way it will allow you to do multiple shots. Then we uh, focus on the subject and we start rocking back and forth. It's the same thing. What I was saying, instead of changing the focal plane. Yeah. You just start rocking back and forth, and then you just hold the button. And so you're shooting at a very high frame rate. High frame rate. With flash. With getting flash. sharp. And we're just moving back and forth. And what we're doing is that we're taking the slices of the subject as much as possible. And then How fast of a frame rate are you? I mean, a lot of cameras do five frames. There's it's, sports it's cameras that do 10 to 12. Oh, those 14. are amazing. Yeah, yeah. 1DX or the, the, right. th three, uh, the Nikon. What do you feel most comfortable? Obviously, more frame rate. Faster it shoots, probably the better. But what what's a good place to start? Five, five frames per second. Five frames per second. It will definitely allow you to get 15, 15 good shots. And are you trying to get fifteen shots all in a row, or can you do the rocking motion a few times? You, and this, and you can you do it back and forth a few times. And then you can just use all those. And pictures. then you can use multiple different frames. The thing is, what's going to happen in that case is that the the focal plane is going to be in the same location but the insect is not, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to take many photos where you're going to see the insect is going to be maybe here, right. and then maybe up. here, and then, but then you line up all the shots, and they mm -hmm. are going to merge that, all together. That's unbelievable. I never would have thought that the physics of that would work out to where you could handhold a focus stack like that. But now I'm learning after looking like an idiot, <laughs> a lot of the images we life. probably critiqued have been done that way, which is an incredible technique that... Um, I, I, we, I need to try it at some point. All right, the last, this is the 16th and final image. Yeah, this one is a beautiful one. Now, do you have any idea? This is Pierre again. I think he's made several of the images in this Yeah, this, video. This, this is actually, a, a, so here what he's doing is that he's actually using a microscope uh, ob obje objective, is that you call it? So this, you don't think this is a camera lens? This is, uh, let me see. Are you reading below? Bellows, he's using Bellows, and the Rhinox DCR-150, so yeah, I mean. So for us normal <coughs> folk, you're gonna have to explain what Bellows and Rhinox DCR-150 well, are. So you, you remember the Bellows, right? For back in the day, that the camera actually had a Bellows? My and dad had one of these for like dental photography. So you put a lens on that's and right. then it allows the lens to move closer to and further. And that was, that's, that's how you magnify before. Okay. Right? So you, you had actually, you, you will put the plate on the camera and then you will, so, you will zoom yep. with the bellows. <laughs> I mean, that's how it was done before, right? So you take the same approach and is, you, you take the bellows, it's the same as extension tubes. Remember that we did the, the, the intro tutorial on reverse photography, yep. reverse lens photography? So as, as when you start pulling the lens away, you're creating greater magnification of the projection mm. of the image on the sensor. So, so that's instead of being one to one, what would it, is it like two to one, oh four to one, 10 to one? In, in, this, in this case here, ten, it probably 10. It says right here, 12 to one plus crop. This is um, magnification 12 times, yeah, 12 plus crop, yeah. So in the tutorial, so this is like more than macro photography. This is almost like microscopic. Is there a difference there? Is there? Yeah. When you start getting into twelve to one, I mean, you're seeing at such a, a magnified. Yeah. Well, view. it will consider. It, this can be considered micro micro photography, right? Uh, but in the world of macro photographers, we still consider it micro. So it's pretty common to do something even as, as extreme as twelve to one. Yeah, and this is this actually requires a heavy stack as well. Uh, so this is not just a single shot. So is it fair to say the more magnification, a 12 to 1 ratio would require, the depth of field is going to be shallower than a 1 to 1. So yeah. in many cases, the closer you're going to get to something, the more frames you might need. Well, what happens is that as you get closer like that, you start losing a lot of light, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's a lot of light that needs to travel through the velos yep. or through the extension tubes, right? So you need to open up your lenses to allow more light to come in and, and to avoid diffraction. 
Yeah. So that you know, so you, there's a lot of things that come into play and becomes issues, right? The diffraction, and then you start getting also uh, uh, hollowing. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that start happening. So you start losing the the quality of the image start deteriorating, and therefore the slices of the very shallow slices are the ones that have all the good data. Yeah. So you just gotta take as many as necessary to complete the photo. In this case, was uh, 35 shots. What is the DCR 150? Is that a lens or is that a strobe? DC no, no, lens, lens. It's a lens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's using a Sony A7 III plus the Velos plus the Raynox. The Raynox, the DCR 150 is a, uh, it's a very small lens that look like a telescope. I mean, a um, microscope uh, objective. Or okay. Yeah. Well, Beautiful that shot. was extremely interesting. I, I have to say, every time I sit down and talk with you, I have a greater appreciation for macro <laughs> photography. And what's so neat, just working with a couple other macro photographers, is that you don't need a lot of gear, but you can take this with you. The, the trouble I always have is I travel to amazing places, but then it's like photo shoot time, and you got to wait for the landscape light. You know, you're shooting landscapes, right. you got to wait for the light. Or if you're shooting models or people, you have, it takes you away from what you're doing. But in many cases with macro photography, you can go on vacation to these incredible places. And if you see something great, as long as you have your setup with you, mm -hmm. you can knock out some amazing pictures and then just kind of go on your way until you find the next thing. It, it doesn't take as much time out of your vacation. That's correct. As a lot of other genres of photography. That, that, that is right. You know, the complexity of the macro photography, it's, it's there, right? But if you have the right gear with you, you can shoot at night when everybody is out relaxing, yep. or you can shoot during the day before you know, like people go to the beach, or while people are having lunch, you can go out and you know snap up a few shots in the afternoon. If you guys <coughs> want more information about this upcoming tutorial, we think it's going to be out in probably the next month or two. Go to the link in the description below. You can actually sign up for the mailing list, mm -hmm. and you'll be notified as soon as this thing's released. And also, what's your website? You guys can see my work at andresmolin.com. Yeah, or in my Instagram, Andres Molin, uh, the Instagram account. Yep, we'll put a link to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So both of those uh, places you can find some of my photographs. Uh, but if you want to know more information about microphotography, I will recommend to watch the video that we did. Uh, yes, the video that we put on our channel, you can also, also see a free video that's on the f yeah. channel. And that video is like one of the most popular videos we've released it's all well. year. Yeah, yeah people well. love it. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited to have that. So definitely check that out. But. Maybe we should get out of here and go see if we can find something to shoot. 100%. All right, perfect. Let's do this.